This is Karen with NewClevelandRadio.net, and it is time for the Intentionality Gurus with Candace Pollock. And today's subject, one very close to my heart, is called Play It Scared. So tell, tell me what you going. think. Yeah, tell me <laughs> what you think of that, um, that might mean or could mean. Well, I think um, our pre recording. Uh, got me to thinking about it. And uh, I think it's about, um, you know, we have all these thoughts in our mind on a daily basis, and we sometimes uh, let them take over. Um, we let we let them invade our thoughts uh, and sometimes get us off track. And I know I've been off track for the last couple of weeks, Personally, as um, you know, my husband has faced some health challenges, and I just constantly think about what's going to happen next, and um, is he really okay? And if he's not okay, what does that mean for me? And um, walking around um, in a state of uh, a fear. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and constant trepidation, which then, you know, shuts down the part of our brain where we can, you know, we get, we get tunnel vision about all the stuff that could go wrong. Right. And that just kind of feeds on itself and, and so on. And I was telling you that way back when I was taking the bar exam, I was afraid, um, you know, like probably anybody, unless you're, you know, totally um, a brainiac. Um, uh, that I might not pass it and it would be embarrassing and, um, it, you know, I would make it mean things about myself instead of the fact that I was, I've never been a great test taker. Um, it, I, I'm a slow perk in terms of um, putting things together. So the idea is that um, fear and all of those things, one is a given, you know, those kinds of things are going to happen. And, um, but how we process it um, dictates a lot of whether we can find our way of coping with it, surfing it or not. So um, what it sounds like you've been surfing some of it and, and being kind of proactive and so on, but um, how does it show up when, when in this particular instance, where does it show up in your body? Um, how does it make you feel, act and, and think? So I've been walking around, you know, I'm a migraine sufferer to begin with, but I've been walking around feeling like I have foggy brain. Um, it's not that I'm forgetting to do things. I'm just not doing them in the same sequence that um, I would do if I was proactive. Um, I let I let these fears slow me down. Um, so one example yesterday was, um, you know, I'm just... I'm just going to go watch a movie that's going to, you know, give me, give me some space. And I know it was something my husband didn't want to watch so I could watch it in another room. Um, and the whole time I was watching it, there were things in the movie that kept reminding me of what I'm afraid of, but I couldn't turn the movie off. Yeah, and so what stands out for me uh, in that is that when we are in that fear state, you know, we're in the hyper um, uh, awareness state about, you know, danger, all the things that could go wrong. And, you know, what they tell us about our body is, you know, the, the um, we tend to, you know, our breathing gets shallower. Um, we tend to be tensed, you know, um, in a big way, you know, over our entire body, kind of like we have to be ready to leap or or dash away from, um, you know, physical danger. And then we are, um, certain things are occurring. Um, we are, in terms of um, how, where the blood is going in the body, you know, it, it's not necessarily going to be um, uh maybe helping us digest our food and so on. It's 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 going to be going to the brain so we can be alert and on, on top of, you know, these things that can be dangerous. And we're more likely to see negative things out there, the signals of danger out there um, with even sounds. You know, um, I know there's a sound I do um, in the house from time to time, um, sometimes when I'm playing, but also 
um, and kind of probably being a little mean playing with my cats where I'll go kind of like that, you know, that noise we make when something bad is about to happen. Yeah. Or, you know, if you've ever been in the car with somebody uh, sitting next to you, you're driving and they make that kind of noise. It's like, what am I not seeing? Right. You know, it just puts us on hyper alert. Excuse me. <laughs> and so the idea, I'm sure you were, it sounds like you might've been um, experiencing was exactly that, that once we're in that danger mode, you know, the uh, fear mode, um, we see more danger and it's, we have to take extra conscious steps to kind of break that cycle. It, yeah. and, and our aperture on um, field of vision on some of the other things that might be totally rational and less danger oriented, um, you know, source of ideas and so on um, are closed off to us as a rule. Yep. That's, you know, Yesterday, more than any other day in the last couple of weeks, I just felt I could I could feel the tension in my neck and my shoulders. Mm -hmm. um, and there's some place where I really don't need it because I'm being treated for a shoulder injury. So I, you know, as soon as I could feel it there, it was like, no, I can't, I can't stay in this mode, whatever it is. And so even while watching the movie, I started doing my exercises which I overdid, okay? So first it was the tension from, you know, the thoughts, and then I created even more tension from overdoing the exercises. And it was like, at that point, I knew I, I had to slow down. I had to really try to shift my thoughts differently. And so I sat and journaled for a while, and that helped because I finally was like letting those thoughts loose on paper where I didn't have to constantly be thinking about them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think the act of, you know, probably focusing on, you know, your writing, you know, the act of writing and, and making sure it was on the paper and you're probably pausing from time to time to capture some thoughts uh, before you put them down it probably was starting to kind of break that cycle of being in that hyper vigilant state of, oh, you know, I, I, you know, the body's signaling, um, alert, alert, you know, yeah. um, danger going on here, danger. Uh, so kudos for that. So the idea in, in this conversation about um, play um, the fear um, basically is just what you were doing because um, it is, unavoidable and we can just acknowledge that it will exist and coexist with it and not have it be an all or nothing um you know element to it so you acknowledged your fear which is huge and just you know being able to see that it's it's a you know it's on our keyboard of emotions it's a natural human emotion uh denying it isn't gonna do any good and then um being able to face uncertainty you know surfing the uncertainty and then, you know, when you were thinking, it's um, and some of the things you said about it, um, some of the other things that could go wrong, that part is in the future. And then there might have been some elements that were in the past. Um, and then, you know, what do we know in the present? And so that can be an important thing to pay attention to. Like, what time zone am I in, past, present, or future? And what do you, what, what do you think about that? Well, that did come to play because um, I was hyper vigilant thinking about what's going to happen tomorrow, what's going to happen next week. And, you know, thinking about, you know, my own health challenges, thinking like, oh my God, you know, uh, the two of us going to end up in a nursing home in, in a week, you know. And I knew that was projecting all those fears that I have because mm -hmm. I don't have any real answers. And then I realized this is just part of life. You know, as soon as I said that to myself, this is part of life. You can't keep worrying about all those things for the future. Just concentrate yeah. on what you are capable of handling today. And as soon as I, and I actually put that on paper. And as soon as I put it on paper, I was able to like almost stop journaling because it was like, okay, 
I get it. You know, I, I don't have to worry about everything. And there's some things that if I worry about, they're not going to change anyways. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, the, I love the fact that one, it sounds like you kind of did some self soothing as you were um, journaling and then getting a handle on the fact that, you know, if worrying about everything worked, you know, we would all do it. We would do it more because we, we have a tendency towards that. We could probably do even better if we uh, really gave it our full attention, but it obviously doesn't work even a little bit. When my husband was dying, it it required a, almost moment to moment conscious efforts to stay in the present. And I knew where it was going to end. You know, there was no changing that, but it allowed me to spend, you know, my waking hours, you know, being with him and not with the future thought of being without him. Right. And that, you know, sounds like I may be conveying it as if it were easy. It was not easy at all. But um, just I would catch myself and say, nope, stay in the present. That's in the future. Or going back on things that we had done together. Um, nope, stay in the present. And it was just a constant pulling myself back um, and so on. And and sometimes, you know, I would lapse into the other time zones in a nanosecond. So it's not like I, I got to stay there um, right. for, for long periods of time for a big chunk of it. But um you know, the idea is understanding that fear, the one that it exists and um, the things that are contributing to it, and then just being able to um, navigate that it effectively with um, staying in the present. What else can you learn from fear? Well, I've always been a worry wart. Um, in fact, my parents used to call me, you know, their dramatic worry wart. And so the more people reminded me of that, the more I worried about things. You know, I took on everybody else's issues. Um, and one of the things that I've been learning over the last couple of days, but especially yesterday, because instead of using the computer to journal, I actually use paper and pen, which I, I've told both you, um, and our mutual friend Christy, I will, I can't journal that way. But yesterday I could. And it truly was a release for me to say, you know, okay, we know what happened in the past, but we're here. And yes, I can keep worrying about the future that, you know, maybe my husband is more ill than the doctors say he is, but he's here right now. And so am I. And so let's enjoy what we can. And it doesn't mean that I have to be ecstatically happy all the time, Yeah, right. but I can be, I can be present. And part of me being present yesterday was being in the same house, but in different rooms. <laughs> that was okay. Yeah, and just anchoring back to the idea that maybe the the manual writing, you know, the having the pen in hand and putting the pen on paper and and pausing in between was, you know, a way of um, doing an activity that takes our thoughts from one thing back to something fear, that's fear um, based to something that's presumably neutral, even though you may be writing about fears and so on. It's not the, exactly the same thing in terms of, you know, maybe the body chemistry and so on. And um, it's fascinating. I've, you know, heard different things about the, the fact of um, the pressure of the pen on the thumb apparently has some particular significance. I, I haven't studied it or, you know, explored it very deeply, but I do um, have heard in several settings how maybe that is a factor because it's a signal to the body. This is not something you'd be doing if you were running from the saber tooth tiger, in other words. Right, right. right. So right. It, things must be not, you know, that um, life or death. Um, yeah. that, that may have been a signal to the body. So um, what other things can you do to nap? Because these things are going to pop up again until you do get some answers regarding um, your husband. So uh, what other things might you do in terms of navigating um, these things as they come up? Well, I know for myself, um, 
I I have to learn to not take on all the emotions that other people are having about it. Um, so for instance, uh, my son, when we finally told him that this last test proved negative, um, you know, he first he got mad at me because we hadn't even told him that his dad was going in for some testing. But I was so grateful that it was negative. I called and told him and I said, um, you know, the reason I didn't tell him ahead of time was there was nothing that he could do other than worry along with me. And mm -hmm. what good was that? Um, and I realized that by not telling him initially, um, it was he was one it was one less thing that I had to worry about. So I guess where I'm going with this is that, you know, sometimes we feel that either we can't share with anybody at all, or we overshare. And this time I I only shared with people who I knew that weren't going to say, that weren't going to make me worry about them as well. And they weren't going to make comments like, oh, don't worry. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And I was so grateful for that, that um, not one of the people that I wrote to made that comment. You know, maybe the comment back was, you know, um, you know, I'm here if you need me or, um, you know, let us know if there's anything we can do for you. But I was just so grateful that nobody said, oh, don't worry, because I would have worried more. Yeah, but I'm interested in the comment about um, more or less having to worry about having other people worry. Well. In respect to my son, I knew that if I had told him ahead of time what his dad was going through, he he probably would have kept saying I should come home or he would have made arrangements at work to come home and work. And it's like, but it wasn't that kind of situation. And so I knew that he was very much like me, that his brain would start going a thousand miles a minute. Now I'm going to have to worry about keeping him calm. So, is that true? Do I have to? No, I don't have to, but it's part of my personality. Well, it's how you've known yourself to be. So, I mean, yeah. that might be worth uh, journaling over because, you know, there. I remember this phrase my husband said to me, my sister was going through a divorce and I was like tying myself up in knots about it, just worried that you know, it might not um, go well and, you know, all the other fallout that comes from divorce. And um, I just, I guess I was, you know, going on about it at home here. And um, he said to me, dear, um, you know, he was a psychiatrist, so he had a much different perspective than I had. And he said, dear, you have to watch the TV screen. You're not allowed to step into the screen and um, be responsible for what the characters say and do. And um, at the time, I couldn't quite embrace that. But in time, I have embraced it. And, you know, I can at least get that fork in the road where I say, okay, you know, this this show I'm watching totally um, stinks. And I'm, I have, you know, I'm, I'm you know, uh, resigned to having to watch it because it's not something that, you know, I, I can change the channel and focus on something else. Um, but if while it's on this channel, I can't change what the characters are doing. And I don't know if that resonates for you at all, but it, it's really been helpful to me all these years later. Well, I think that's one of the reasons that I didn't tell my son, um, because I could, that was something that I did have some control over. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I just know that if, even now telling him that everything is okay, I'm, he's still like, you know, are you sure everything's okay? And I'm just like, you know, I'm not going to go there. Um, you know, I've told you once and we're just going to leave it at that. So you were choosing not to turn to that station in other words. Right. Exactly. Okay. okay. To that station. Um, and, you know, it's like, well, I can still come home. And it's like, but there's no reason to come home. 
um, you know, and then, and, and then you would be responsible for some of the things related to him because he would be in the house. And, right. You know. Exactly. And it's like, you know, and I, and I told him, um, and I told one of my brothers, if I need you, I will pick up the phone and I will call you and tell you, I need you. Mm -hmm. Um, but in, until you get that phone call, don't worry about it. Um, because I'm handling it. Mm -hmm. Um, Maybe not always the best way, but I'm handling it. Yeah, and you know why you should be able to handle it the best way when we all struggle with that, right? Right, exactly. We, we can handle. I, I guess the best we can all say is that we can um, try to handle it um, yep. effectively, more effectively, or at least intentionally. So, on the topic of intentionality, um, how would intentionality in your actions um, and so on? Um, be a factor if at all it doesn't have to be i'm just curious um i think by you know saying to myself every day um you know i'm going to focus on the things that are most important the things that i have control over um is and i think that should be my focus no matter what. Um, and I think that's good for everybody to, you know, wake up in the morning and what do I have control over that I can do today um, to make the accomplishments that I want to make? Um, and for the last couple of weeks, I have not done that as well as I would like. But even this morning when I got up and um, reflected on journaling yesterday, it was like, okay, what can I do today? what what is the most important things for me to accomplish and um i made my list and um that's what i'm going to focus on and you know i think that that helps me move forward mm -hmm. well and at a minimum you're you're switching your brain from the reactive mode to something that is um you know intentionally um set and, mm -hmm. and um probably more impactful in terms of staying out of the, the that fear cycle um, and so on. Um, where, you know, what what if there's a breakdown and you find yourself back in the, the fear loop? Um, what what occurs to you there? Um, uh, probably uh, run towards the fear initially um, and then hopefully hit that wall and say, hey, you know, you have options and look at my options. Um, but it's, I tend to run straight into it when it happens mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and trying to, um, trying to come up with a resolution. Uh, the sad part is that sometimes those resolutions take you to places that you really don't want to go. Um, and, that's, and that's something that I've realized in the last couple of weeks. It's like, you know, you thought way too far in the future and that future may never even exist. So, you know, I had to figure out a way to backpedal and not, not worry I'd say as much, even though the worry was still in the back of my mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it. Yeah, it, we can coexist with it, and that's the playing it scared. You know, the idea, and I, I heard that phrase um, just recently. It was somebody I was in the car doing errands, and um, somebody was interviewing a a man who's an actor, and he apparently is doing a really avant-garde thing. I don't know if it's a podcast or if it's on, um, you know, some kind of program, other program, but he, it was very daring. And um, so the interviewer was asking about, you know, was this um, scary for you to take on this kind of stretch role and so on? And they were talking about it. And then she shared a phrase that I just stuck out for me um, that, she was an actor at one time. Now she's more into producing and, and those kinds of things. But she always taught her kids to 
to play it scared, to be able to go into auditions and know, you know, you might not get the part. You may totally, you know, embarrass yourself or um, somebody may make scathing um, comments, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, you know, go in knowing that being scared is going to be an element and, um, you know, shake hands with it and, you know, but don't let it um, take over and, and, you know, stand in front of you. So, um, you know, kudos to you for, you know, being able to coexist with it for a while, even when it probably stunk. Well, and I, and I think for our listeners, one of the things that we have to understand is that um, this is part of the roller coaster of life. Yeah. Um, you know, if you, if you don't realize that, I think it makes it even more difficult to face. And mm -hmm. that's, you know, as I started going through this, um, you know, I thought back, well, wait a second, you know, he had a health scare a couple of years ago and he came through that. Okay. And I remember feeling very similar to what I was feeling. And it was like, you know, I'm not asking for miracles, but I have to understand that my thoughts don't necessarily predict the future. I mean, if they did, we'd win the lottery, right? Yeah, exactly. Every time we bought a you know a lottery ticket, you know. So knowing that, you know, has really helped. Mm -hmm. And journaling, whether it's you know pen and paper, or if it's you know doing it on the computer, mm -hmm. um, I'm getting it out there and I'm sharing it and finding people responding, going, "Oh, I went through that." Or yeah. I'm going through that. And it's like, okay, I'm not the only person on the planet. Right. Part of our common humanity. Well, yeah. and the other thing I really want to bring home is the idea that you're building resilience. You know, every time that you're able to pull yourself back to being on the brink of fear or being, you know, in deep fear and feeling, you know, the the, the scariest parts of it and not bringing yourself back, you're reinforcing those, you know, mental muscles, so to speak, the neural pathway, the uh, neuro, you know, neuroplasticity um, to be somebody who is hypervigilant and not able to, you know, ever take their foot off the fear gas pedal. Um, but by being able to pull yourself out of it, even if you're, you get, you know, tumbled around by it um, for quite a bit, the fact that you can pull yourself out is that fork in the road that you took. Right. That's the important part. That's what builds the resilience. That's what changes the brain and takes you from the fear part of the brain to the um, the more reasonable part of the brain and so on. So, you know, actively practicing it. And it sounds like that's exactly what you're doing. And then did you commend yourself for making that change and being able to find yourself on the other side of it? Yeah. Um, and I continue to, even, you know, when I'm in the middle of that fear, Mm -hmm. um, I remind myself, wait a second, you know, um, you may not like doing this, but you can do it. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I remember something my mother said to me many years ago, uh, when my oldest son was born, um, he ended up being a forceps birth because the doctor was going on vacation and wanted to hurry up and deliver my mm -hmm. son. Mm -hmm. And that first night when they went to bring him to me, um, they wouldn't let me hold him because his soft spot was all enlarged and they were more concerned about him. So they just brought him in and they let me see him uh, touch his hand. And that was about it. And the next day I was told they were rushing him to Children's Hospital because they thought he had fluid on the brain. And it was suggested I call my family and tell my family. And I called my mother. My mother said, well, what do you think, honey? And I said, I don't know. And she said, no, you do know. He's your child. What do you think? And I said, well, mom, it was a forceps birth. Couldn't that have caused it? And she goes, well, I'm glad that's the way you're thinking. And that's what it turned out to be. And I don't think my mother knew that she had, you know, those magic words to say to me, mm -hmm. but it was, you know, what is your gut? What is your gut feeling? Mm 
-hmm. And I didn't think there was anything wrong with him. I mean, I heard him cry, you know, when he was born. Um, I held him initially when he was first born, um, you know, but somebody was taking precautions mm -hmm. and I could have continued to worry, but just her thoughts. And with that, I called for my doctor and I said, you need to release me today because I'm going over to Children's Hospital. And he goes, oh, no, no, no. Your son's going to have needles and whatever. And I said, I don't care. And I went there. And as soon as I held him, I said, do you think it could be due to the forceps birth? And they said, what are you talking about? It wasn't recorded. So they had no idea. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Huh? So they were treating him for something that might be. Mm -hmm. And at that point, he had to stay in the hospital for 10 days. It was like, okay, well, then I'm going to stay in the hospital with him. Mm -hmm. So well, now they encourage that, you know, and they, they, to my knowledge, they don't use forceps and, you know, no. all, all of these things. But the point is they, they want the parent to be with the child early on, um, yeah. have some human connection. Yeah. So I learned that back then. I didn't realize I had learned it until recently. And it's mm -hmm. like, yeah, what does your gut think? Mm -hmm. You know, and, you know, sometimes the gut is telling you something you don't want to hear, but, um, you know, oftentimes what your body is feeling, um, you know, gives you the answer. So, yeah, but we're going to go forward and I'm going to try to get out of foggy brain. Mm -hmm. and, uh, we'll do this again in two weeks. Well, you sounded pretty unfoggy this morning. Well, thank you. My head still feels foggy, but uh, I will get out and do something about that. Yeah, it'll clear. All right. Take care. Thank you. Have a great day now. Bye-bye. Right,